a very good evening to all of you. I presume that you people are all new lawyers. Everyone is a new lawyer? Yes. All of them enrolled? So I have just come here to give you uh, some sort of uh, insight into how an advocate should come conduct himself or herself in this profession. Firstly, I would say that this is a very noble profession. The, act, the profession of advocacy, it's a very noble profession. And if done properly, if conducted, if you conduct yourself properly, I have no doubts that you people be, will be very successful in this profession. Firstly, I will uh, deal with court craft and etiquettes. As per the constitutional mandate, any citizen who is a resident within the territorial jurisdiction of India has a right to claim free and fair justice going by the natural rule of law. The origin of justice and its equity led to the establishment of different courts across the country. The Supreme Court of India first came into existence on the 28th of January 1950. Two days after our country became a re republic. In the initial phase, the Federal Court of India sat for 12 years between 1937 and 1950. This was touted to be the home of the Supreme Court for years until the Supreme Court acquired its own present premises. The Supreme Court of India currently comprises of the Chief Justice of India and 33 subordinate benches, which are forming a part of the judiciary in the highest court of appeal at the present moment. Supreme Court is the highest court and thereafter subordinate it uh, to the Supreme Court. Each state has its own high court. And subordinate to the high court are the, uh, the district and session court, the subordinate courts. In, uh, sub uh, so, and the, there are other subordinate courts also in each district, each locality. Now, legal profession is not a business but it's a profession. It has been created by the state for the public good. Consequently, the essence of the profession lies in three things. Organization of its members for the performance of their function, maintenance of certain standards, intellectual and ethical, for the dignity of the profession, and last but not the least, subordination of pecuniary gains to efficient services. This is very important for you people to imbibe all this. You understand? Pecuniary gains should be subordinate to efficient services. Efficient services come first. Then moral etiquettes which are required to be followed by the practicing advocates when they are appearing in the courts. For every advocate who is a part of the legal fraternity, it is essential that he or she abides by the code of conduct which has been laid down in the Advocates Act 1961. The said act has laid down for the rules and regulations that each practicing advocate is required to follow. There are a few essentials that are required to be followed by each practicing advocate when they are appearing in the court, they are as follows. I'm just enumerating them. Number one, it is essential that any advocate who is appearing before any court or tribunal, he is respectful in his approach towards the bench and also that no personal comments are made on any of the presiding officers or the co-counsels in any case, this is very important. You must be utmost respect respectful towards the bench. It is also essential that any advocate who is appearing before any court or tribunal is always fully dressed in the lawyer's uniform, uniform as prescribed in the Advocates Act 1961. My grandfather, and let me tell you one instance, uh, my, how I have been brought up. My grandfather, Professor Hans Raj Mehta, retired as the head of the law department of Punjab University, Chandigarh, in 1968. So, uh, 
even before I took up this profession, even before I did LLB, since childhood, this principle is ingrained in me that every advocate, even my father was a lawyer, he, uh, you must have seen Punjab Law Journal, he used to edit that. It's a well-known journal on the revenue side. And they have ingrained in me that even if you are just entering the court premises for any work, you must always be in full court uniform. Very important. Number three, it is important to note that for any counsel who is appearing in a case, that he has to wait for his turn to speak and speak only when required. By doing so, we are showing respect and gratitude not only towards the bench, but also towards the opposing counsel. And this is strictly in compliance with the morals and ethics of the practice of the legal profession in India. An advocate should not all, always be a mouthpiece uh, of the client and he or she has to ensure that, he, that when he or she is appearing in the court, he is acting not just as a representative of his client, but also representing the legal fraternity as well. Due respect and compliance to this fact has always to be given. Number five, while making appearances in the court and trying to get a favorable order or judgment in the favor of the client, it would strictly amount to an unhealthy means of practice if the advocate is indulging in any illegal means or is encouraging the client to utilize such means just to get a favorable order. Number six, it is also essential that the wordings used by the counsel is strictly in compliance with the rules which have been made and no scurrilous remarks should be made by the counsel who is appearing in the court in relevance to a case or in any other way. Now I will be dealing with drafting, pleadings and filing with the registry. While being in the legal profession, the drafting of any petition su or suit, appeal or any deed of uh, conveyance or any legal document comprises one of the most essential parts while filing a suit. Hence a few points are to, to be kept in mind while the counsel is drafting any application, plaint, written statement, appeal, or any legal document. They are as follows. Firstly, the plaint or petition should state only the relevant material, uh, material and relevant facts. It is essential that any application which has been filed before the bench, any bench, only states the material and relevant facts and no unnecessary facts are disclosed. The petition should be as brief and to the point as possible. The advocate should avoid voluminous petitions which are difficult for the bench to read due to paucity of time. This practice would lead the court to believe that there is a serious case on the cards which needs to be intervened with. The usage of any sorts of information which is frivolous and vexatious may lead to the dismissal of the case. From my own experience, I am saying the thinner the petitions, the more, the better, more effective the case is. You understand? You should not make it be, make it voluminous. Judges don't want to read voluminous petitions. Pa uh, para 3. In the cases where a plaint is being filed in the form of a civil suit, it is essential that no evidence is being disclosed in the plaint. Any form of evidence which is required for the court to believe the case of the plaintiff or petitioner, it should be attached separately as annexures with the plaint. The same, same rule would apply to the filing of the written statement or replication, if any. The, any evidence, uh, it should be attached only as annexures. Number four, a plaint or petition must not state the law. Judges already know the law. It should be presumed that the bench is already well conversant with the law. But only the provisions which are applicable and under which 
the said suit or case is falling make it easier for the judge to understand the law which is in force so you people have followed no law needs to be stated while a case is being filed number 5 the base of the drafting of a case is laid down by following the basic structure of the petition which is inclusive of court name case number date and place where the case is being filed followed by the grounds on the basis of which the present application is being filed followed by the prayer and the verification and affidavits of the parties if required number 6 the grounds very important the grounds are the facts which are necessary for the court to believe in the case of the petitioner or plaintiff and they should be made in a way which are exhaustive and strictly to the point this requires tremendous hard work Ground, grounds must be exhaustive and to the point i am repeating it i am repeating those aspects which are very important for you people to follow the advocate should incorporate the relevant provisions of the impugned orders or other annexures in the petition or plaint so as to highlight it in the petition or plaint so as to make it easier for the bench to understand the issue involved understand you should incorporate the relevant provision the relevant paragraphs of the impugned order or any Uh, document that you want to refer to in the petition the relevant portion in inverted commas then it, the it is easier for the bench to understand the issue involved then ne uh, next where there is any person who is involved in any criminal case and an application for the grant of regular bail has filed an application for grant of regular bail or anticipatory bail before any honorable court and the accused has several other cases registered against him the advocate must mention the list of other cases with along with the fir numbers details of the firs and the offenses involved in such applications must disclose the all the criminal antecedents of the accused it is very important otherwise it leaves a very bad impression on the bench and next while drafting a written statement it has to be ensured that the reply is in consonance to the facts which have been stated by the plaintiff in his plaint and the reply to each para has been made with conviction and efficacy while drafting a written statement the respondent is at liberty to disclose a new set of facts which may be as a counter to the facts stated by the originally by the plaintiff and have not been disclosed by the plaintiff then the drafting of the application petition or appeal or any other application should be well resonated and well and truly in compliance with the cause of action of the suit or the case this is in brief regarding the drafting procedure then the filing of the case in the registry whenever a suit or case is placed for filing it it is immediately placed before the registrar of the honorable court who then further lists it before the honorable bench who has the jurisdiction to try the said suit and pass any order in compliance with the facts and circumstances of the case along with evidence that is both oral as well as documentary evidence to support the case of the plaintiff and the defendant now here i am saying from personal experience regarding the objections raised raised by the registry you must it it will be very helpful for you if you keep in touch with the various notices issued by the registrar and by the office of the advocate generals so that you don't have to undergo the harassment of repeated objections and refiling and all that that is itself a uh, quite a harassing procedure but you have to learn how to do it then i will give you some insight into basics of criminal practice for every advocate who wants to indulge in the practice of criminal litigation it is important to know a few points they are as follows number 1 in a criminal case the onus of proof is entirely on the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused 
it is the prosecution that lays the opening statement in a criminal case in which the prosecution has to submit all the evidence adduced before the honorable court which can lead the court to believe that the accused has committed the crime the opening statement is laid by the public prosecutor which is the first stage of the case where the charge sheet is submitted by the police ahead in the court the public prosecutor is the counsel who is acting on behalf of the state and the private counsel is the defense counsel who is acting as the defense counsel of the accused it is the defense counsel who has to cross examine the prosecution witnesses and conduct the case in such a manner that the case of the prosecution is struck down and the uh, accused is acquitted of the charge now here it's very important that the cross examination the art of cross examination is it's very important for every advocate to uh, master the skill of cross examination because that is how you will strike down the case of the prosecution it is very important for you all to develop your skills in this aspect of the case in criminal cases the statements which are recorded under section 161 of the criminal procedure code can only be considered to be admissible in evidence if they are recorded in the presence of a judicial magistrate or any subordinate magistrate or as per the provisions of the indian evidence act 1872 the statements recorded in the absence of any judicial magistrate will not be considered to be admissible in evidence by the rule of law this rule also specifically applies to confessions where the accused is making a confessional statement it has to be in the presence of judicial magistrate or any subordinate magistrate any sort of disclosure made in police custody is not admissible by way of evidence then the presiding officer of the evidence adduced the presiding officer on the basis of evidence adduced statements of witnesses the statement of the accused under section 313 of the criminal procedure code medical evidence on record and all other necessary evidence adduced as well as the arguments and contentions raised by the counsel for the prosecution and the defense may either convict the person for committing the offense or may acquit him of the charges which have been framed against him then where the judicial magistrate has reason to believe that the accused person has resonated good behavior during the conduct of the trial then he is at liberty to release the prisoner on probation under section 360 of the code of criminal procedure and the probation probation of offenders act 1958 in cases where the nature of offense is heinous and have a punishment where the sentence may go up to imprisonment for life those cases are exclusively triable by the court of sessions and the judicial magistrate who is trying the case or the judicial chief judicial magistrate is at liberty to pass an order of committal of the same to the court of sessions then in cases of rape it is well and very truly mentioned in the previous precedents of the honorable supreme court of india that in a case where the charge is framed is that under section 376 of the indian penal code then the sole basis of conviction can be the testimony of the prosecutrix this rule can apply specifically to those who are minors and have been victims of the offense of rape then circumstantial evidence circumstantial evidence is essential in determining the guilt of the accused where a case is under section 302 of the indian penal code if there is an accused who is tried for a murder it is essential to look into the circumstances in which the act was committed the accused can only be convicted of the offense of murder if the magistrate trying the said case is firmly con convinced for reasons given in writing that the circumstantial evidence supports the case of the prosecution 
if the circumstantial evidence is in favor of the accused, then he is at liberty of claiming defense in regards to that and he can be in a position where he, he may be even acquitted of the same. In a case of rape, it is essential that as per the provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure, the medical examination of the accused as well as the victim is conducted in order to gather evidence which may lead to either the conviction or the acquittal of the accused. Mind you here, the medical examination of the accused is also very important in rape, that he has been, he is capable of performing the act, that is very important. I have, some, I have gone through some Supreme Court rulings where the uh, 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 person has been acquitted because he was, he was not medically tested, whether he was capable of performing the, although there are uh, cases where even on the sole testimony of the victim, specifically where she is a minor, uh, accused have been convicted, but there are judgments where the, where, the, uh, the, where the accused has not been medically examined, then the person can be acquitted of the charge. Then, while preferring an appeal in a higher court, the appellant is at liberty to file an application for suspension of sentence under Section 389 of the Criminal Procedure Court. The appellant may be granted the benefit of having his sentence suspended if he has been in custody for a reasonable period of time and on the basis of good behavior. Then I will go on to litigation simplified. What are the measures that should be taken in order to simplify litigation? The procedure which is followed in our courts is very adversarial and the courts are loaded with cases daily and sometimes even the listed matters don't get taken up as there is too much workload on the courts. And with so many fresh cases being filed on a daily basis, it becomes a heinous task to look after each case and go into the details of it. However, there are some methods and ways by which the litigation can be simplified. They are as follows. Number one. The counsel, while acting on behalf of his client in his case, should be clear about the understanding of the case. Very important. You people should be very well prepared with your case. And should be well versed with the facts of the case and should also be having a suitable amount of knowledge about the evidence which has been brought on record by either of the parties. Number two. Where there is any relief that is sought by the contesting party, the drafting of the application should be such that it makes it efficiently easy for the sitting judge or presiding officer to just go through the matter on record and come to a conclusion about what needs to be done in the case and how the proceedings should proceed. Then number three, while arguing any matter in dispute, it is essential that the counsel who is arguing is sticking to just the main essential points which will incline the sitting judge or the presiding officer to have a deep consideration of the submissions made by the arguing counsel. Please be precise and to the point. Do not make irrelevant comments. Number four. While the cross-examination on oath of a witness is being conducted by any counsel, it is essential that the counsel who is conducting the cross-examination sticks to the facts and matter which, which has been disclosed in the case by any means and no irrelevant questions or matter is being dragged into the case just to make a case out of something. If by any means any irrelevant questions are asked by the counsel, then the chances of drawing a suitable and beneficial conclusion may become difficult for the sitting judge or the presiding officer. Number five, it is highly recommended that the usage of alternate dispute uh, resolution mechanisms such as the mediation, lok adalat, arbitration, etc. are considered for settling the disputes out of court where the dispute can be settled out of court. By doing so, the process of litigation can be avoided and the disputes can be settled at a 
faster pace and with more efficiency. Number six, while presenting any case and preparing any case, it is important that the intent of the counsel who is preparing the matter is that by any means the relief that the client is willing to claim must be settled and taking unnecessary adjournments and finding ways to prolong the case will only delay the process of litigation, thereby causing injustice to the contesting parties in the case. I would like to conclude my lecture here before uh, just uh, rising, uh, finishing, I would, uh, if you have any questions for, for me, uh, I would be more than willing to answer. You can get about 10 minutes of that, if you people have any questions. Any question? I hope you people have understood what all I said. I wish you all tremendous success in this profession. It's a very no noble profession. And my blessings are with you always. All the best for a very successful innings, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. My gratitude to the Bar Council Chairman of the Bar Council, though he is not present here, but I express my gratitude to Mr. Suveer Sidhu, Chairman of the Bar Council of Punjab and Haryana, who gave me an opportunity to express my views here. And Thank you so much.